Um, so some of you were here yesterday, so you might hear me repeating myself. But my job mostly is to ask the questions. Um, I don't have a company to sell, so I'm not going to have any advice. Uh, I do have a magazine to sell. You should all go buy a subscription to The Economist. Michael, do you want to tell us um, what it is you do, what company it is that you just sold, and what the company does? Sure. Um, just quickly, can I see a show of hands of anybody that's used Trello before? Just raise your hand. All right. Wow. <laughs> this is why I love coming to conferences. Um, so I don't know if I have to tell. They already know what it is. Um, it's a visual collaboration tool. If you ever use a sticky note and jot down notes and you know use lists to organize your thoughts, uh, you'd be able to pick up Trello in an instant. Um, if you've ever been in a, a startup or an office and you see people putting those sticky notes on a wall, it's essentially a digital version of that. All oh, right. OK. As you can see, I have not used Trello personally, but I have seen the sticky notes all over my office, although sometimes they make big Pac-Man to the window. <laughs> Is that the same thing? Um, all right, so you started Trello, you started within Fork Creek, which you also started. Right. Um, you spun it out in 2014, and then you sold it earlier this year to Atlassian uh, for $425 million. How did you know this was the right time and the right offer? That is a good question. I think, um, it, I don't know if, if, if our case was, uh, is very typical, I think, um, you know, we started Fog Creek, bootstrapped that company. I've also raised VC and done the startup thing. Uh, um, another company we created was Stack Overflow. Mm -hmm. um, so we spun off Trello. You know, we knew some investors took money for it. Um, and, and really, from the very first day that we started Trello, the, the, the vision for the app was to build something international. Like, it's awesome to come to Europe and see all the people using it, um, to build something global and universal that could be used by everyone. And so when we did that, you know, we thought, oh, we'll get 100 million people to use it. We'll go big. Um, and that was always the vision. So as, as time went on, we had a lot of success. And um, it was actually last fall when uh, Mike Cannon Brooks, the co-founder at Atlassian, gave me a call. And I know him because mm -hmm. my, the company Fog Creek created a product that competes with Atlassian. So I've known him for, for a very long time and competed very hard in the marketplace with him. Um, but he said, hey, let's have lunch. I sort of thought, okay, why not? You know, yeah. everything's going great for us. A lot of VCs were interested. We had complete control of our cash flow situation. Um, everything was great. And so I said, why not? I'll sit down and have this conversation. And I thought, um, let's just hear what he, what he has to say. And I thought, you know, I've talked to some corp dev people before. It's a very... There's a process is sort of like, okay, well, you know, just tell me the number. Like, right. <laughs> but we sat down and two founders and started talking. And the two things that we talked about were the people mm -hmm. that built Trello and the product and the vision for the product. And we just talked about that for an hour and a half over lunch. And I found out later that he had flown all the way to New York from Sydney and then flew mm. back after our conversation just to have an hour and a half lunch, but I didn't know that at the time. Right. Um, I just thought, oh, he's in town, I'll just have lunch with him. So what was it about this conversation that made it, you think it was the right thing? It was all about the culture and the vision for the product. So what, what, who are the people that built Trello? What are the things that we care about? And then from the product perspective, like where, what was this long-term goal? What do you want this tool to be? How do you right. see that in five years, 10 years? And um, actually when we, finished lunch and I went back to the office, I was sort of scratching my head thinking, uh, did, did he try to acquire us? I'm not really sure. Right. Um, but, it, but I realized that we had so many things in common about the way that we thought about what Trello could be and about how we thought about building a company. I think probably a lot of that had to do with the fact that we created companies around the same time in the early 2000s. And right, so, so fit is one thing, it's sort of fit, culture fit, the right vision, but you'd also mentioned something about timing, right? Um, the last time we spoke, you were talking about if you wait X years or if it's been so many years since uh, you started your company and you get an offer, assume it'll be as many years again. So is, does that play into it as well? Yeah, a, a little bit, I think. You know, like that was actually a Jason Lemkin tweet that he set out. He was like, just assume that however long it took you to get your first offer, it'll probably take you that long to get your next one. Um, and I think what, what you're trying to do is, I mean, there's a lot of factors. You could, you could have started a startup and poured all your finances into it and be in a position where somebody approaches you and you're like, 
I, I, I spent a decade building this, like I, this right. is, I have to take it. But, um, you know, in our case, I started thinking about, you know, obviously, is this a good offer on the financial terms? Is it going to mm -hmm. be good for the cap table and the shareholders? But really, m there was a bigger question of, you know, I'm not done with this mission. Like the thing that we're building, I've got a lot more things I need to do and I'm bullish about doing them. But in the long-term vision of the space that we're in, this collaboration space, the productivity space, um, it's pretty competitive, mm -hmm. you know? Like, and it's just getting more competitive every day. And um, when you think about building the kind of company that's gonna compete in that space, um, there was an opportunity to basically snap my fingers and become that company, right? Like right. you take Trello, it's 100 people, has this one product that people love, and instantly we become a 2,000 person mm -hmm. public company with the resources and the lessons that they've learned over the last 15 years competing in that space. We have a whole product lineup, all those things sort of come together. And that's when I, when I was thinking out like five, 10 years, you know, mm. how do I speed things up and, and is this gonna actually make us be able to compete even better to get to that long-term right. goal? And then finally, there's the personal aspect as well. You, you start something, you pour a lot of yourself into it and then you have to, to a degree, give up some control. Yeah, so I think th that, that was always a, that was an interesting one for me because I had, I started Fog Creek back in 2000, so I've never really had a boss mm -hmm. before for you know 16 years. Um, and the question was like, how's that going to work? And actually, it's not really that different. Like I, I feel like, um, but I don't know if this is a generalizable statement. Like I think mm -hmm. you know because this company, Alaskan, was built by two founders that are very similar to the two founders, myself and my co-founder co Joel, who built Fog Creek. Like. Day to day, things are not that different. Right. Same values, and in fact, one of the things you know they've done 18 or 19 acquisitions before, so they're always learning, learning from their mistakes in the same way we were. And and um, one of the first things that they did was they said, "Let's put a do not disturb on Trello and try as mm -hmm. hard as we can to not sort of come in." They, they'd seen if you have 100 people and you have 2,000 people over here, and they all want to help, right. good intentions but you could end up in a situation where you're just stuck in meetings all day, like talking and telling people about things and trying to, trying to figure out how to help, but it's just overwhelming the, the sort of resources that are coming in. So, you know, we, we went into it using all that knowledge of the, the acquisitions that they had done before and said, okay, just keep doing what you're doing. Run as a standalone service. We'll try to look for places that we can add value okay. and then we'll, we'll do that when we see it. So actually, let's, let's delve into that a little bit. So we've discussed sort of how to make the decision, how you, know it's, um, how you know it's the right time, whether the fit is correct. Then there's the actual process, the move. Um, and you still have to keep a company going. You still have to keep your customers happy on a day-to-day -day basis. It has to be seamless. Yeah. Um, what are the biggest sort of difficulties that are posed by, by an acquisition? Oh, I think if you're a founder, um, the biggest difficulty is the secrecy. I think most people value transparency in startups and, um, you know, it's hard in that early stage when you're not sure how this is going to work because there's a lot of things that have to fall into place, right? You can be like, this is a good idea. You write down a term sheet, you sign right. that two-page document. It's a long road before the lawyers get the 200-page merger agreement, plus mm -hmm. you have to go through, you know, antitrust. And, like, there's all these outside influences, there's due diligence right. to dig up stuff. Um, and during that whole process, as you're getting closer and closer to the close and the final thing, um, you might bring in a couple people, but mm -hmm. generally the, the rest of the company doesn't know. And for me personally, that was like, that was awful. I like lost 10 pounds. I like, I didn't shave. I grew this beard. I looked like a caveman. Um, it, it was really, really hard. I remember the, the moment um, that I told everyone, we actually had a, a company offsite planned right around the same time, mm -hmm. so we were trying to hit that date. And um, most of our company is remote, 60% work remotely. So, you know, once a year we all come together. So we all came together and I got up in front of everyone and they had to put it out on the press in New York before I could tell everyone, you know, so I'm waiting and then I'm like, okay, we got by. And I just remember that moment being so relieved, right. you know, just like, ah, oh, like finally, like I can share this with everyone. Of course, they're all like, huh, like what? <laughs> but you've been going through this for weeks. Right, right. So that's, that's the personal aspect of it, what would keeping the business running? 
Um, right. So then, once you've told them, all right. When you tell people, the first thing is, like, I think in this case it was sort of like shock. Like, are you being serious? Like, what, like, how did? Where did this come from? Because mm. you, you know, they don't have any insight into this. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you drop this bombshell. And then the second thing is they want to know, like, what about me? Like, what's my? What happens to my job? Yeah. Like, what does this mean for me? And you sort of cross off those things, you know, and you give them their offer letter. You give them the details of the, and then, you know. Over time, it's sort of like, okay, and then they start meeting the other people. They're like, oh, these are great people. They're really smart. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I can think of all these ways that this could help me in my job. Um, so that, you know, goes along. And then, you know, now it's, it, now that we've gone through this, it's almost like when you get a new job, you know how you start using all the new tools and you have to get up to speed and that. We've been through that phase. And mm -hmm. now kind of day to day for most of the people at Trello is not that much different than before. Well, do. You say, you say that the fit is quite similar, that they've gone through the day-to-day, -day, uh, or rather that the day-to-day -day is not that dissimilar. But there is, there's always going to be a difference between a company of 100 people and a company of 2,000 people. The culture sure. will shift a little bit. Yeah. How do you handle that shift? Well, I mean, the, 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 the problem, the, both the good thing and the bad thing about having a giant company is you have a lot of resources and you're doing mm. a lot of multiple things at one time, but then your communication overhead is much higher. Right. What, what do you mean? Like, um, there's more people, so there's more communication channels, mm -hmm. right? That, that's incre increasing exponentially. So, as you, you know, we can, at Trello, it was sort of like to make a decision, we would just, somebody would just walk over, <laughs> should we do this? Sure, do it. And then we would just do it. And now that has a lot of implications. Like, I could come up on stage and decide if I was sitting here to tell people about some metric at mm. Trello, right? Like, some number. I can't do that anymore because we're a public company now. Right, right. So now, like, there's small things like that, but just also, you know, so that, that is a change. I think, like, even as fast as a large company wants to move, there's a certain speed that they can mm -hmm. move at. And so part of that do not disturb and running Trello as a standalone service was to preserve some of that speed and keep us innovating on the product and shipping. Right. Um, so we managed to do that. Are there, uh, one of the other things you'd mentioned when we spoke had to do with um, invariably there will be some overlap, so you'll have to let some people go because some jobs are no longer required because you just have too many people doing the same thing. How do you handle that? That's going to be a difficult conversation. Yeah, I think, I think in a, in a uh, like the bigger you get, the more impactful that is because hmm. you build, say you build out a finance team and usually after an acquisition you don't need two finance teams. Right. Um, in our case, uh, well, actually, we outsourced a lot of th a lot of the uh, operational things for the business. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's actually getting easier now. If you make a startup, like, you know, there's a there's a SaaS service that'll run all your payroll. There's a SaaS service right. that'll help you with bookkeeping. And so, if you have more of those, then you don't run into this problem, and also you mm -hmm. don't have to solve that on your own. Um, we were relatively small for those overlap things, and there's still a lot of work for those people to do. So, generally, um, everyone that was with Trello before is still with Trello today. All right. Um, but I think that, you know, as you get bigger, that could be much more impactful, and then it's, it would be pretty Stickier. uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. So you've made the decision, you've made the move, you're at the new place now. Um, one thing which sounded pretty interesting, which you were mentioning earlier, is you've gone from being a smallish company to a large company with lots of products, an entire suite of products that allows you to compete more effectively. Tell me a little bit more about that, about how well, think, exactly that works in a day-to-day yeah, basis. Yeah, you know, if you look at the way people adopt products now, um, you know, the old model, you had this top-down enterprise sale, you, you actually had hard, you know, a lot of times you'd buy a server, you'd install it mm. in the server. Now you have cloud, so anybody can use freemium products. It's like people just bring their own tools. It's like you have a mm. team in the marketing department and they want to collaborate, or they're designers, they sign up for Envision, or the, mm. you know, they start using Trello, or you know, it's, it's much easier for people to just grab these tools and get started. So that sales process changes, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not this top-down approach, it's, this, it's more of a bottom-up thing. And um, that, that basically, that's one of the ways that Trello spread throughout the organization. Is that kind of what you're getting at? I think so, I think so. So rather than have you know, salespeople going out and saying, here, look at all these things we offer. It's rather because Trello is quite popular and successful as it is. Um, but I see how that helps Atlassian, but how does, how, did the, how does their suite of products help you compete? Because that's one of the things you said earlier in our conversation. Yeah, so I think there's two things that you have to do nowadays. Because there's 
the sasplosion of tools out there. Um, you know, being a plat that plat that word platform, everyone's using it. But this idea that you're connecting all those things together mm. is really important. And I think that's like you you have to start with that. So even cases where if you look at Microsoft Teams, for example, mm -hmm. that just launched, um, they Microsoft has a competitor to Trello. It's called Planner. Uh, but one of the things that they wanted to do was to embed Trello into Teams. Mm -hmm. So we. We said, all right, that's awesome, let's do that. Right. And we built that integration. Um, and it, so I think like you, you, pe people that are building tools are sort of understanding that model of adoption and you have to understand that you're not gonna be able to come in with a suite and mm -hmm. say, use all these tools. However, it's also the case that when you have a tool that does one thing and people understand it mm -hmm. and they understand who made it, it's actually pretty easy to get them to use something else. Right. And you can actually make the connections between those tools much tighter and mm -hmm. um, do more than you could with some other third party who has to basically pr present an API to the world. Like they can't do you special favors, right? Sure. They're like, here's our platform, this is what you can do on it. And if you wanna do something unique or special, they're like, well, you know, we have to be a platform. We can't like start yeah. making exceptions. Um, in the case where all these products are under one roof, if we're trying to integrate with HipChat, for mm -hmm. example, we can do something that pro Microsoft Teams probably couldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. All right, so you've got that advantage. Then you also have a lot more resources. Um, how, can you give me an example of how that has played into just making your life easier? <laughs> yeah, so, um, like the f right after the acquisition, we had all these open headcount requisitions mm -hmm. for for getting um, new new people to join the team, and so we ran a program internally at Alassian called we called it Trellocation, where we were like take people that were working on other products and they right. could come over to Trello, and that would help. Not only would we get great people because they would obviously be people that that were, had been there and were successful, mm -hmm. um, but they would be able to bring over some of the knowledge of the tools and things that were available inside Atlassian. So right away we got 15 people to, to come over. That right. They started this month. Um, it took a while, you know, like some people are in Sydney, they moved to San Francisco. Hmm. We, we hooked up with some remote people um, all over the world. And so that was like day one, that was a huge advantage, which right. is just add more people to the team. Um, and, and I've noticed actually one of those people that started, I noticed it was very interesting because he started on a Monday and by Wednesday had already fixed some bug in production, mm -hmm. which, you know, normally happens at a company, but it takes a while for people to understand all the different pieces. And right. this guy was just like, bloop, like I get it and effective so, right so away. So you solved the problem of having uh, jobs you needed to fill. You got a little bit of integration with the wider company as well. Yeah. Um, and it was relatively straightforward, so that's great. Yep. What about on a, so that's a sort of instant thing. What about on a sort of more ongoing basis? Um, there's two things I think, and they kind of go hand in hand a little bit because um, they're more marketing things. Uh, people like Trello, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but up until now, the 22 million people that have signed up, it's all word of mouth. Hmm which in some sense is great, because like people love it so much that they're gonna tell somebody else to use it, but it's also kind of bad because probably more people would find it useful if they knew about it, right? right? We weren't able to spend money on advertising because we were a startup and mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to watch that cash burn. Um, so we never did it. We just sort of relied on the product to sell itself. Um, but now we, don't, we, we have a good product and if more people knew about it, they would probably find it useful, so right. we can do that. So we can start advertising. The second thing is, um, it's always been important to us building an app that the whole world could use to uh, market it to the whole world. Mm -hmm. Like you can use Trello in 21 different languages. Um, you know, we have people on the ground in Brazil, in um, the Nordics, and in France, um, and you know, but it was kind of a skeleton crew. It's just three mm -hmm. people, and one of the things that we get from connecting to Alassian is now this is a global company. Right. There's an office in Amsterdam, there's an office in Japan, you know, like there's an office in Manila. There's all these, and plus they have relationships with partners all over the world. Mm -hmm. So instantly we became like part of that family and that actually opened up a lot of doors for right. us. All right, so we figured out how and when to sell your company, how to make the move, what happens afterwards. Finally, um, just to sort of end on a slightly different note. At, 
Under what conditions do you think you might not have sold Trello? Um, let's say, I'm not going to name names, but let's say uh, Corp Dev showed up from a big tech company and, mm. and you know, I, there was a productivity app that got bought a couple years ago that just got shut down recently by that, by one of those companies. Mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. it just, what, there, if the, if the company is too large, you mm. almost, what is going to be the impact that you're going to have? Right. You know, whereas in this case, it was like, Trello is a super strong brand. Elastian has really strong products. I felt like joining that company, we actually had a, a big a big chance to make a change in the trajectory of the overall company. Whereas in one of those other cases, one of those big tech companies might have right. showed up and you kind of be like, okay, I got to watch the clock for my earn out and then yeah, I'm yeah. out of here, you know? Or they call it rest invest. On the, you're on the roof in Silicon Valley, the guys on the, in the lawn chair. But so there are, there are times when getting acquired may not be the best thing for Yeah, I mean, company. unless you did it and you're like, this is what I was wanted. I wanted mm. to get a bunch of money and that was the whole point, right. right? If that was the case, then maybe that would be the right move for you, but it wasn't the case this time. Great, great. Michael, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.